Muy buenas, pues aquí estamos de nuevo en el área 5 de este ARI 2022, 20 edición de ARI y contamos en esta sesión que es obviamente uno de los ejes centrales de la reunión y de todo nuestro interés que es la cirugía del cristalino y las lentes intraoculares. Cuento con mis compañeros aquí presentes, Francisco Poyales, Joaquín Fernández y vamos a tener un, un panel de, de debate y a que nos van a acompañar a lo largo de las dos sesiones siguientes, Jaime Ranberry. Moisés García, Miguel Ángel Gil y Javier Mendicute, que es un panel de lujo que nos va a acompañar en las dos. Las dos sesiones van a versar la sesión 10 eh, sobre lentes intraoculares e eh, eh, innovaciones y la sesión 9, eh, que es la que viene a continuación, sobre cirugía que trata y nuevas tecnologías. Por tanto, la nueva tecnología es por donde vamos a comenzar, seguiremos con lentes y eh, a continuación tendremos una sesión 11, que es una sesión que es, se nos pidió por la audiencia el año pasado, que es abordar el tema de la ruptura casular, cómo prevenirla y cómo manejarla. Es la primera vez que introducimos una sesión eh, solicitada por nuestra audiencia, a la cual agradezco esta sugerencia. Por tanto, cedo ahora a, a mi compañero amigo Francisco Poyales en la presentación de esta sesión que comienza inmediatamente. Muy bien, muchísimas gracias, Jorge. Bueno, pues tenemos una interesantísima sesión. Los eh, ponentes van a ser Oliver Find, eh, Javier Mendicute eh, y Richard Packard. Desde luego no podíamos tener eh, un panel más, más interesante para esta sesión. Así que yo creo que vamos con ellos. Muy bien. La tecnología es el tema y vamos a ver qué nos aporta la nueva tecnología ahora y, y en el futuro eh, de acuerdo con la evidencia que tenemos en este momento. Adelante, Oliver Finden. Dear colleagues, thank you very much for inviting me uh, uh, as a representative of ESCRS uh, to talk in your symposium today. Um, I unfortunately am actually taking, well, unfortunately, I, I'm, I'm going to be with my daughter because she has her graduation ceremony. So that's why I can't uh, be uh, with you live. I was asked to talk about uh, today's trends in cataract surgery and premium IOLs, and that's not an easy task because it's a very, very big field and I only have a few minutes left. These are my financial disclosures, not relevant to this talk. So I want to talk about presbyopic correcting IOLs, but also to a certain extent about toric IOLs. And when I talk about trends, it's really great to use um, something we've done since several years now, um, six years to be quite exact, the so-called ESUS clinical survey together with the Fundings Land Group. And what's happened in that survey is that we have 1,200 in the uh, first years, but then now, last year, 1,550 respondents per year um, telling us what they do and how they do um, the treatments to their patients. And so it gives us a very good overview also over time of uh, understanding trends. Let's look at presbyopic correcting aisles first. So here you can see the trend of 2016 with 7% of current uh, cataract procedures involving presbyopia correcting IOLs in patients that qualify for it and now has raised up to 11%. And you can see on the right side for the different years 2016 to 2021 that uh, of course bifocal lenses have reduced significantly in number, trifocals have increased slightly, but especially the so-called EDOF group or let's say um, extended range of vision lenses have increased And this is not taking now into account the so-called monofocal plus. I can show you that on this graph. On the, two, on the left, you can see 2019 and the right 2021. And what you can see is that the, the percentage of trifocals relatively is decreasing because the extended depth of focus is increasing. And now, especially um, in, in, uh, in these last two years, the so-called enhanced monofocals have been in the rise. So we can see that these lenses, which have less dysphotopsia um, um, than the classical trifocal lenses, are, are increasing significantly. The reasons are that probably also the needs may be different from uh, the population today. So here you can see an interesting questionnaire, which was actually from the US, um, looking at the 55 to 64 year olds, then 65 to 74 year olds and 75 plus um, and looking at what they actually do during the day, their demands. And you can see that reading is actually in white, is a very small part um, of time that they actually uh, spend reading. Most of it is leisure and sports or um, household activities. Um, and those are usually at intermediate distance quite often. So I think also to a certain extent, we see um, a changing patterns and also especially um, in, the, in the elder population. So this was actually the first monofocal plus IOL on the market, the uh, iHands Toric, 
which has um, a continuous change of refractive power towards the center. There are, so there are no rings and no zones that are visible from the outside. The overall spherical um, uh, uh, aberration, spherical aberration correction stays the same um, as with the standard classical um, um, correcting um, aspheric lens, the Technus monofocal lens. And here you can see a study from Gerd uh, Alfard's group from Germany um, and showing in the left lower um, diagram that uh, the, the, the focus curve uh, of, of you would, the expected defocus curve with this um, eye hands lens, monofocal plus lens, is significantly better than the blue line, which is the monofocal line. And then you can see a few other lenses, which are also sort of in the monofocal EDOF arena, which also uh, allow this kind of slightly um, better defocus curve. Here you can see um, a study uh, where you have a comparison between the monofocal lens uh, in red and then the monofocal plus lens, uh, the eye hands in blue, and then the EDOF lens, the Symphony, which has been around since several years in green. And what you would expect, the Symphony outperforms uh, the monofocal plus lens, especially when it comes to near visual acuity. However, for intermediate visual acuity, actually they, these uh, authors did not find a significant difference. And both the monofocal plus and the, uh, the um, EDOF lens do significantly better than the monofocal lens. Here another study from Asia, again showing that intermediate distance between the EDOF lens, in this case the Symphony, and the monofocal plus for intermediate, very, very similar, and only for no, near the EDOF lens slightly outperforms uh, the lens. Uh, the, the monofocal plus lens. So monofocal plus for intermediate vision really does very well. This is also stu actually study, a recent study we now presented in Milan, the toric eye hands at 66 centimeter intermediate visual acuity. And if you look at the right part of the graph, you can see the distance corrected intermediate visual acuity. And actually 77% have a pretty useful intermediate vision of 0.3 logma or less. So quite useful vision. So what are really the obstacles why uh, EDOFs and uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, presbyopic correcting lenses are not being used more commonly. And the one you can see here again from our um, questionnaire cost to the patient uh, about 60%, but also still concerns over nighttime quality of vision, concerns of a loss of contrast visual acuity. And I think this is really from the bifocal era, maybe to a certain extent for the trifocal lenses, where we know this is the case, but much less so for the EDOF lenses and essentially none as far as we know from studies. For the monofocal plus segment. Here looking at again the clinical survey of the patients they perceive of the percentage who are dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with the near intermediate and distance vision one year after surgery for monovision with a standard monofocal lens and presbyopia correcting in gray and you can see that here the Monovision uh, is outperformed by the presbyopia IOL, so presbyopia IOLs do better, uh, as you would expect. But still, the numbers even for monovision are pretty good, and especially if you combine monovision with a monofocal plus lens. This is a really good alternative for some patients. So what are the key sources of postoperative dissatisfaction after refractive IOL patients? Well, of course, residual refractive error, dysphotopsia, we know that. Also, what is a near point? Some patients are used to very close reading. That may be an issue. Of course, posterior capsule classification and any other comorbidities uh, that, that will um, reduce um, uh, visual acuity or visual quality in general. And also then, of course, you have this idea of neuroadaptation. We know that that kicks in up to six to nine months after surgery. And, and I think that's probably the most important, that patients have realistic expectations. And if these expectations are unrealistic, then you get into trouble. So how do you actually manage refractive uh, error after surgery? This is um, a, 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 actually a study from Jorge uh, looking at piggybacks, uh, which actually is, is more accurate than IOL exchange, but there may be some issues with glare in some, in some patients. IOL exchange, of course, is, um, may induce some more stigmatism and, and may also be more risky than using a piggyback lens. And the x laser is probably the most accurate method, but not everybody has an x laser. Uh, and, and some patients also, of course, because of dry eye and other issues, may not be good patients for that. So here you can see that actually uh, x laser is being used most, uh, most often by, by surgeons for, for these situations. But better would be to avoid residual refractive error to start with. Um, but you can see here, actually, many are still using SRKT, a quite old-fashioned formula, um, and this is one of the reasons why we also put the ESCRS IOL calculator into, 
into um, action now at Milan. It, it's actually um, the ESRS IR calculator will take seven different formula, which are an, an online formula, which are available. Some of them very modern AI based uh, formulae. And essentially, you have to enter the data once and you get the output for all these formulae. So this may enhance uh, um, uh, the uh, performance of, of power calculation, at least in difficult eyes. What about residual astigmatism? This is a nice study by Schalhorn, uh, Steve, Steve Schalhorn, who looked at a, a large number of patients and looked at satisfaction. And what he saw is with these um, uh, presbyopia correcting IOLs, if you have residual postoperative cylinder or astigmatism, then uh, satisfaction uh, goes down uh, or dissatisfaction increases if you want. Um, asking our um, again our survey, um, most think that with uh, with a presbyopic correcting IOL, you should ideally not have more than one day of residual astigmatism after surgery. And if you do, then again most will go for laser surgery, but there are quite a few who would go for piggyback or even glasses or maybe LRIs in some cases. Just a few words on toric IOLs. Here on the left, again, you can see the trend of a presbyopia correcting IOLs, like I showed you before. Now on the right side, you can see it for toric IOLs, and there is an, a steady incline over the last few years. Looking at the uh, surface, what would you do, for example, if you have somebody uh, with 1.75 diopters of astigmatism in blue? Most would use a toric lens. For low ones, like 0.75 in pink, actually on-axis incision seems to still be the most used um, uh, method of treatment. Um, so there is a discrepancy between what people say they would be doing and then what they actually do, because we know that the toric lenses are not being used as much as you would expect just from the population. What about alignment? Here it shows that about uh, 5 degrees would be tolerated if it's 5 degrees off the alignment of the IOL, 6 to 10 degrees, 40 percent, and would still tolerate and own above 11 percent, only very few. So most obviously would like to have the um, axis within within uh, five degrees if possible. And you can see the digital image registration using quite complex systems which are in included in your microscope uh, are increasing significantly in the last two or three years. But most will still use um, a Mendez ring during surgery and do some kind of preoperative marking technique. So to, to summarize preopia correcting IOLs, you have to expect, uh, you have, if you have unrealistic expectations that are unmet, that's when you come into trouble. So missing the refractive target, so either use modern formulae or if you are, have a post-refractive surprise, correct it. Nighttime driving is an issue. You can hope for new adaptation, otherwise you should do an exchange. And if you have loss of near vision in low to mo moderate myops, we know that that is always a risky business because they are used to doing many things without glasses, makeup, and so forth. Um, so you really need a good informed consent to tell patients that they may need uh, reading glasses for these issues. And of course, um, you should always under-promise and over-deliver. Uh, that's, uh, as you know, for presbyopic correcting IOLs is a very important um, factor still. So last but not least, uh, we will have... Um, the next Congress in Villa Moura, which is the winter meeting in Portugal, and then next year in September in Vienna, I hope to see you at the 41st Congress of the ESCRS. This is um, um, from the 8th to 12th of September, so please mark that in your diaries. Thank you very much for inviting me. All the best. Muy bien. Y a continuación vamos a tener otra charla que nos van a dar en este momento. Se puede ya proyectar. Buenos días. Agradezco al profesor Alío en particular y a todo el comité organizador en general su amable invitación a participar en este congreso ARI 2022. Muchas gracias. Bueno, el tema del que voy a hablar hoy es ¿qué aporta hoy en cirugía cristalino el láser fentosegundo? Me inicié en esta técnica en el año 2012 y desde entonces hemos tenido ocasión y posibilidad de trabajar con las diferentes plataformas que han existido en el mercado. Pero se me pide que dé la perspectiva del año 2022 en relación con esta tecnología. 
Está claro que Flax ha demostrado que en relación con las cápsulas Resis permite hacerlas más circulares, más centradas y del diámetro deseado y que además ofrece mayor resistencia que una cápsula Resis manual. También es posible reducir el uso de ultrasonidos en la cirugía de cristalino. Menor uso de soluciones de irrigación, mayor seguridad sobre endotelio y nervio óptico, menor riesgo de edema macular quístico, menor contracción de la cápsula anterior y menor tasa de pacificación capsular, mayor estabilidad de la lente y menor riesgo de descentralización y tilting y es especialmente útil en casos complejos. Sin embargo, ¿qué es lo que no ha demostrado Flax? No ha demostrado resultados refractivos, pero los resultados refractivos no nos engañemos, dependen de muchos factores y entre ellos el femtosegundo sí que mejora la predicción de la LP, mejora la predicción de muchas fórmulas que son función de la queratometría, la longitud axial y de la LP, mejora el centrado y el diámetro de la cápsula Rexis, disminuye la contracción de la cápsula anterior y permite un mejor posicionamiento, estabilidad y disminuye el tilting de la lente. Y por supuesto, una menor tasa de fibrosis de la cápsula anterior y en menor grado una disminución del riesgo de patificación capsular. Así que lo que diríamos no mejorando los resultados refractivos sí que contribuye a mejorar la seguridad, homogeneizar variables quirúrgicas, posibilita la automatización del proceso, aumenta la eficacia y permitirá desarrollos futuros. Respecto a la reproductibilidad, es mucho más precisa que la cápsula Rexis manual, mejora, como hemos dicho, el diámetro, la circularidad y el centrado, aunque esto es función del tipo de láser, del interface que utiliza y de los parámetros utilizados. También mejora la resistencia y aunque esto ha sido demostrado en ojos de cerdo, cabe sospechar que en humanos vaya a ser lo mismo. Y en relación con la integridad, evidentemente las imágenes que ofrece el fentosegundo son menos elegantes que las que ofrece una cápsula Rexis manual, pero sin embargo la resistencia, como hemos visto en la diapositiva anterior, ofrece mayor resistencia. Respecto a la pacificación y la contracción de la cápsula anterior, manejando la energía y el diámetro del spot, conseguimos destruir mejor las células que bordean al límite de la cápsula Rexis y eso va a favorecer que disminuya la fimosis y la opacificación de la cápsula anterior. En relación a qué aporta hoy en cirugía de cristalino el láser fentosegundo, que en definitiva era el tema de mi presentación de hoy, pues diremos que contribuye a diferentes aspectos de la cirugía. El más importante es que por primera vez utilizamos un sistema de navegación guiado por imagen. Nunca antes una cirugía ocular utilizaba estos sistemas de navegación para determinar el proceso quirúrgico. El uso de tecnología de imagen permite identificar estructuras, medirlas, advierte de ciertas peculiaridades anatómicas y anticipa muchas complicaciones. Esto lo hace diferente a los láseres que se utilizaron en los años 90, en la primera década de este siglo, que no utilizaban imagen para lanzar el láser. Somos capaces de identificar apes de cristalino, cápsula anterior, cápsula posterior, grosor de cristalino, densidad y posición. Y las medidas son de una alta precisión. La tecnología de Shainflug además permite hacer, desarrollar imágenes de realidad virtual que lo que va a permitir es hacer identificaciones tonales del cristalino y podremos categorizar la dureza del cristalino. Esto tiene también un impacto como veremos posteriormente. En relación con el futuro, pues esta tecnología va a, ser, va a permitir las capturas de imágenes con mucha mayor rapidez y mayor precisión en la identificación de los diferentes planos de interés quirúrgico. Las cápsulas, el núcleo, el epinúcleo y el cortes, posibilidad incluso de identificación celular, lo veremos. Mayor penetración también en tejidos, identificar estructuras limbo, espacio retroiridiano que son muchas veces hoy inaccesibles e incluso identificar la cápsula posterior en cataratas en las que los límites hoy son inciertos, ¿no? cataratas blancas y cataratas negras. E identificación de sintométrica zonal, esto es muy relevante porque con el uso de la tecnología láser podemos Hoy con el láser fentosegundo hacer que el daño colateral sea prácticamente inexistente. Cortamos con precisión en la zona en la que hemos medido y hemos utilizado tecnología de imagen. Los diferentes láseres trabajan con diferentes parámetros y tienen diferentes posibilidades, pero en definitiva al final lo que trabajan todos ellos es con la energía, con el tamaño y el espaciado del spot y con la apertura numérica para trabajar en diferentes planos. El futuro... Los láseres van a ser mucho más ergonómicos, ya está en el horizonte del próximo año diferentes compañías, sobre todo Bausalom y Lensar, que están trabajando con plataformas todo en uno, en el que el fentosegundo, el microscopio e incluso la facomusificación van a estar en la misma columna y van a permitir que desde la misma posición el cirujano haga todos los pasos quirúrgicos. 
además de más ergonómicos, más ultra rápidos, serán también versátiles y te serán autoprogramables. Esto es muy interesante. Ya hay láseres que están trabajando con tecnología OCT que lanzan un impulso eh, y son capaces de identificar la densidad de las diferentes estructuras y programar la potencia y los parámetros de láser que tienen que ser disparados en cada zona. Y la parte fundamental es el sistema de acoplamiento. Para poder captar imágenes, para poder procesar esas imágenes, para poder disparar el láser en las estructuras deseadas, hace falta que el sistema de acoplamiento sea perfecto. Sabemos que los interfaces sólidos y líquidos tienen diferentes características y la característica del corte es diferente, pero en el futuro lo que vamos a tener son interfaces mucho mejores, las superficies van a ser adaptables y esto va a tener mucha mayor importancia en la robotización en cuanto que va a servir de referencia para la instrumental. El último aspecto, uno de los últimos aspectos sería el tema de la robótica. Parece un sueño, una quimera que no llega, pero estoy seguro que en la próxima década vamos a ver aplicaciones de robótica en la cirugía de catarata. En el futuro, el FLAX, y cuando yo pienso en FLAX y en robotización, pienso que el FLAX tiene un gran potencial. Permite capturar de imágenes y lanzar láser con alta precisión, permite una localización en 3D, permite programar movimientos y velocidad, evita el temblor y la imprecisión derivados del uso de la mano, puede hacer multitareas, va a permitir automatización de ciertos procesos, puede, podemos hacer ya cirugía guiada por imagen y teleoperación, así que está claro que esta es la antesala para la robotización del proceso quirúrgico de la cirugía de la catarata. Pero el futuro dependerá de los usos clínicos y los usos clínicos se están ampliando. Hoy en día hay lentes intraoculares que pueden ser modificadas ya implantadas en relación con su estructura funcional incluso con su estructura dióptrica. El láser funcional puede modificar una lente difractiva, una lente monofocal estándar o viceversa, puede modificar la potencia dióptrica de la lente intraocular y estas aplicaciones las vamos a ver en nuestra práctica, eh, en nuestra práctica diaria. Sin embargo, a pesar de todas estas ventajas, el mercado del láser frente al segundo está estabilizado. Hasta el 2016, se, hasta el 2026, perdón, se piensa que no va a impactar más que en el 3,6% de los procedimientos quirúrgicos. Pero aquí también hay brechas entre el mundo desarrollado y el mundo no desarrollado, evidentemente, por el coste que tiene esta tecnología. Pero si vemos un escenario en el que nos solemos mirar mucho, vemos que a nivel mundial la penetración del láser frente al segundo para cirugía de catarata es del 3% y sin embargo en Estados Unidos ya es del 9%. El 38% de los oftalmólogos ofrecen esta tecnología en cirugía de catarata en Estados Unidos y hay unos factores limitantes. Muchos abogan la escasa relevancia clínica en relación con seguridad y resultados. Claro, esto para un cirujano de alta experiencia puede ser cierto, pero para el cirujano estándar probablemente el láser fentosegundo mejore la calidad y la relevancia clínica de sus procedimientos. Es cierto que tiene un alto coste. Esto suele, puede hacer que solo esté justificado en centros de alto volumen y además el procedimiento no es financiado, puede no ser accesible para todos los pacientes. En cualquier caso, lo que yo personalmente creo que el factor que más ha condicionado que nos expanda es la, la disrupción de la rutina quirúrgica, altera los circuitos y el flujo de pacientes. Con los láseres ergonómicos que vamos a tener el año que viene, estoy seguro que va a favorecer el desarrollo de esta tecnología. En definitiva, si hacemos un DAFO, vemos que las debilidades son las que son, las amenazas, la inaccesibilidad para muchos profesionales establecen una corriente de opinión negativa en relación con esta tecnología, pero ofrece unas oportunidades que están ahí, la mejora de la ergonómica de los nuevos equipos, la mejora de la tecnología de imagen y la mejora de los láseres, la posibilidad de optimizar los parámetros a las necesidades que vamos vislumbrando en los procesos quirúrgicos actuales, la posibilidad de estandarización, hay publicaciones que unifica, unifica el estándar de diferentes cirujanos con, nivel, con diferente nivel de formación cuando se utiliza el fentosegundo, la posibilidad de hacer aplicaciones en robótica que ya muchas de las cosas que hace el láser fentosegundo son cosas que podemos soñar para aplicaciones robóticas en cirugía de catarata y bueno, hay nuevas aplicaciones, algunas hemos mencionado y otras están por venir. Sinceramente, creo que hoy la tecnología láser fentosegundo ofrece los estándares para acercar la cirugía de catarata a lo que puede ser la cirugía de catarata en el futuro. La posibilidad de utilizar imágenes que pueden ser procesadas con precisión micrométrica que además van a guiar al láser, permite la robotización de muchos pasos quirúrgicos. 
creo que es una puerta que hemos abierto que no, no, no la podemos cerrar. Creo que en el futuro la tecnología Fentosegundo abrirá nuevas perspectivas a la cirugía de cristalino. Muchas gracias. Bueno, Muy bien, pues, Javier Mendicute, y ahora vamos a pasar al siguiente ponente. Pues nada, agradecer a Javier desde luego su magnífica charla. La siguiente eh, ponencia es la eh, capsulotomía automatizada y catarata blanca por el doctor Richard Packard. Eh, Richard, go ahead, please. I'd like to thank Jorge Alia very much for asking me to be part of this uh, meeting. My talk today will be on automated capsulotomy and white cataracts. My financials are below. We're pretty good at dealing with standard eyes, so what about more complex eyes? What about white cataracts, for instance? Tripan blue certainly helped, but seeing the capsule was only part of the story because of the intralenticular pressure in intumescent cataracts. Here we can see the original Argentine flag sign video that was submitted to the ESCRS video competition. See that the eye has been stained with tripan blue, OVD has been put in, there's a uh, chamber maintainer, and as the capsulotomy is being created, the intralenticular pressure is going to take over very shortly, and we'll see what happens. It's starting to split now, there it goes, and the surgeons who were watching this noticed a distinct likeness to the Argentinian flag, which you can see on the right of the screen. On this basis, being patriotic fellows, they decided that they ought to recognize this fact so that they stood up and saluted the flag. Very important. But the important thing was that we had a problem and there have been a number of techniques described to overcome this imbalance of pressure inside the capsule. You could do a can open a capsulotomy You could overfill the anterior chamber with a high molecular weight OVD, a mini rexis and then spiral it out, puncture and cortex aspiration, high frequency radiodiathermic capsulotomy, preoperative YAG laser anterior capsular puncture. All of those certainly would help, but was there an automated technique which might help even further? There's femtosecond laser anterior capsulotomy, precision pulse capsulotomy called ZEPTO, and selective laser capsulotomy, which is traded as capsule laser. The femtosecond laser was first used by Solde Nagy for cataract surgery in 2008, and it was a fundamental change in the making of the capsulotomy. For the first time, we could make capsulotomies of a given size, which were truly circular, in a given position, with little risk of tear out during the capsulotomy, and without the variables of a manual technique. But there were caveats. A second room might be needed for the laser, which interfered with surgical flow. The cost of the device was high, as were the running costs, and the advantages of flax needed to be shown. What about femtosecond laser with white cataracts, however? It normally gives a precisely sized capsulotomy of see we've seen, and it certainly can be created very quickly and it's surgeon-centered but there is a release of liquefied cortex as the anterior capsule is breached, and this may prevent creation of a complete free capsulotomy cap. Are there ways to avoid problems, and how often do they occur? Here we can see an attempted flax capsulotomy, which had to be completed manually. In the upper left picture, there's a release of lens milk, which obscures the laser beam. Tripan blue staining exposes the incomplete capsule opening. Capsulotomy is completed manually, And there is good 360 degree coverage of IOL, but there, is, uh, there had been a, require to com uh, a requirement to complete this manually. Here's a study from India where they looked at a, com a, a comparison between femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgery and conventional fake emulsification in white cataracts. They had uh, approximately 40 patients in each arm of the study, and the sexual distribution was. Uh, was fairly good, and they had a number of cases with the release of milky fluid, which were roughly the same between two arms of the study. 
In the flax cases with fluid free-floating type 1 capsulotomy were achieved in 23.5, that is 4 out of 17 cases. Manual completion of the capsulotomies were needed in 76.5%, i.e. 13 out of 17 cases. And of these, 9 out of 17 had microadhesions, so-called type 2 capsulotomy. And 4 out of 17 had an incomplete area of capsulotomy of 1 to 2 clock hours, a type 3 capsulotomy. Here we can see another less than satisfactory result with flax. The eye has been docked and fluid is seen underneath the anterior capsule. Once the laser is actually put into action, you'll see what happens. It's all lined up now, the measurements have been done. And you can see there is that sudden uh, loss of lens milk as the uh, capsulotomy uh, is begun and the capsule is punctured. Here's one method to avoid this, as reported by Berko Dick and his team. They did a laser-assisted mini-capsulotomy, a new technique for intermesent white cataracts, which was reported in the Journal of Refractive Surgery in 2014. A mini-capsulotomy of 2 mm diameter is initially created to release the intralenticular pressure. Then, remote, then remove the li milky liquid that spills out without causing harm to the anterior chamber. Next, the laser is redocked to the patient's eye, and a second 4.5 to 5 mm sized capsulotomy is created. All cases using this two-step approach had good quality capsulotomies and 360 degree overlap of the IOL optic. What's surprising is that all the white cataract cases in which Femto was used, shown on, your, on YouTube, uh, required tripan blue to see if the capsulotomy was complete. And you can see some examples of this here. Let's have a look at another approach. Precision pulse capsulotomy, which is marketed as Zepto, now has a new handpiece with a new nitinol ring, which is designed to deliver more consistent energy for a strong and precise capsulotomy. There's also a modified suction cup, which allows for improved proximal suction for more consistent circular and centered capsulotomies. And the handpiece is easier to use, it's more ergonomic, and it uh, provides a smooth usability. There's also a new power console. The device cuts a capsulotomy of 5.2 millimeters. This is what an SEM of the capsulotomy edge looks like. You can see that it's rounded and it certainly is uh, elastic. If you look at the comparison of strength in the study impaired human cadaver eyes, you see, can see that uh, precision pulse capsulotomy appears to be considerably stronger than both flax and manual capsulotomy. Let's have a look at uh, PPC with a white cataract. This is obviously done without dye. It's also from a video from Vance Thompson. We've seen how the technique works. So we're using the first Perkinji image here. Obviously the patient can't center because they wouldn't be able to see it. And the capsulotomy is created and uh, moved away. And once you take the uh, PPC device out of the eye, you can see that the capsulotomy has been created. And the lens there is it's moderately well centered on the capsulotomy. Let's have a look now at capsule laser. This creates a la selective laser capsulotomy. It has a much lower capital cost than Femto, a lower cost per case than either Zepto or Femto, with no disruption to the surgical flow. It uses minimal space in the operating theater it's attached to the bottom of the microscope, and there is a small console. It provides consistent accuracy of sizing, circularity, and centration. How does it actually work? It operates through the absorption of the orange wavelength, 590 nanometers of laser energy, onto a tripan blue stained capsule, converting type 4 collagen to amorphous collagen. The triple helix or undergoes thermal unwinding due to disruption of the hydrogen bonds, and this allows shrinkage. And we can see a diagram of what's going on here. There's the well-organized type 4 collagen, which is changed by this uh, thermal process into amorphous collagen, which is much more elastic. 
As the collagen undergoes this phase change, it creates the capsulotomy with a rim of high degree of elasticity and a tear strength associated with amorphous collagen. This is what the edge looks like. It's not dissimilar from that created with uh, the PPC device. And you can see where the amorphous collagen is on the cut edge here in the, uh, the bottom right picture. We did a study uh, with the paired cadaver eyes that's similar to that which had been done with PPC. And you can see that if you look at the relative tear strength, if CCC is 100%, flax is 70%, and capsulosa is 150%. This is quite a similar sort of result to that seen with PPC. And it is significant at P less than 0.01. Selective laser capsulotomy using capsule laser is another approach for white cataracts. Once the capsule has been stained with microfiltered tripan blue, the anterior chamber is thoroughly washed out, and this is very important. The eye is overfilled with optically clear 2% sodium hyronate. As the eye is fully sealed and pressurized during the current sub 0.3 second laser excursion, the liquid eye, liquefied cortex does not escape and the capsule remains stable. The central tripan feature assists centration without patient assistance, and we'll see more about that in a moment. Prepare the eye for laser by injecting microfiltered tripan blue. The tripan blue has a specific gravity which is lower than aqueous, therefore it sits on the surface of the anterior capsule. You need to leave it there for 60 seconds before doing a washout, and it's very important to do a thorough washout before you uh, proceed to using the laser. What's very interesting here is that you'll see right in the center, underneath the first Perkinty image, is an enhanced area of staining by the Trepan Blue. And we've decided that this might be useful, and so it has proven to be for centration of the laser beam. Here we can see the Caps Laser Console. It's set for four five millimeters. Here's the foot swish, which you use to control the laser. We're now going to turn on the laser, center it on the feature that you can see in the center, and then fire it by depressing the foot pedal. So we get it lined up on this tripan central feature that I've already described. And once it's well centered, then you can fire. You don't need to worry about the Perkin image here because of the fact that you've got this central feature. What's interesting here is you can see how much pressure there is inside the capsule because the capsulotomy cap appears to be too small for the area of the capsulotomy opening. So in summary, flax is less than satisfactory unless special methods are taken due to release lens fluid obscuring the laser beam's passage with white cataracts. PPC works with white cataracts, but the availability of capsulotomy sizes is limited. SLC, capsule laser, allows good centration of the capsulotomy due to the tripan central feature without patient help. A range of capsulotomy sizes is also available for this device. The OVD pressurizes the anterior chamber, but therefore there is no escape for, of a lens milk once the capsulotomy is created. The stained capsule enhances visibility of the capsule during FACO and also IOL implantation. Thank you very much for your attention. Excelente, Richard, muchas gracias. Y vamos a recibir ahora un mensaje de la industria de la empresa Biotech. Nos estresa que la lente se pueda voltear. Un paso importante, o sea, es una lente muy buena. Y esto no va a pasar con la lente IQ. Y especialmente el tamaño de 13. Lo van a hacer que, bueno, que tengamos un control. El material de la lente OptiFlex es un material muy resistente a la formación de microvacuolas. Y esto puede ser el mejor hidrofóbico en lentes que nunca he implantado. Y con una rapidez de resultados eh, bastante impresionante. Es una de las escasísimas lentes con las que me siento cómodo. Confirman una respuesta excelente a todas las distancias. De una manera mucho más agradable, mucho más vistosa y con menos posibilidad de que podamos encontrar algún volteo a la hora de poner la lente en cámara anterior. O sea, quirúrgicamente se comporta de forma excelente y el aspecto de la lente es excelente. Los estudios de laboratorio sugieren una gran seguridad.
debate. Bueno, pues eh, vamos a abrir el debate sobre los temas tratados en, en esta sesión. Así que, muy bien, cuando queráis. Tenemos ya en pantalla a Richard Packard. Richard, thank you very much. Thank you for being there. Eh, Javier Aranberry, hola. Javier. Monsar García, ¿cómo estás? Y Miguel Ángel Gil y Javier eh, Mendicute. Muchas gracias a todos. Bien, entonces, ¿os parece que empecemos ya? Entonces, primer asunto. Richard, we, we shall start with your talk. In English, right? And in this way you can quit if you want. Right? Yeah. Well, it, for me it's clear, you know, that castrotomy is the main accomplishment of fentosecond laser. Later on we'll talk about the fentosecond presentation was excellent, Javier. But then we have now a very advanced technology with fentosecond that only is useful for the purpose of castrotomy. This is my opinion what is happening. And the cost effectiveness is not good. So the castrotomy is one of the issues that, in my opinion, deserve attention, deserve standardization, and finally, deserves to be used in all cases, from simple to, to difficult ones, without having a complication or a potential for problems. So what, what, what do you think about the ideas of the automatic astronomy, the, the, the availability of techniques today, and what is the future that you anticipate to the application in general in our practice? Well, well, in my, in my uh, practice, I, I'm using fentosecond laser in 90% of my cases, so it's my regular uh, <coughs> practice. So when you make your uh, practice this way, uh, for you the comfortable uh, uh, standard is, is, is this one. And uh, it make all the, the surgeons of my clinic to be working uh, exactly the same way. So I was able to recognize uh, who was the, the surgeon uh, when, yes, I was looking an eye in the, the lamp. And, and nowadays, it's, it's, this is impossible for me. Mm -hmm. So the, the level the, is, is, is going up uh, in, in the, the, the medium level of the clinic. So for me, it's a, it's a real advantage. And my situation is, is, is much more comfortable to, uh, working with the, with the fentanyl laser. Uh, uh, nowadays. Uh, a, a question for, for Richard Packard is, well, you can use the fentanyl second laser using uh, dye in the capsule and introducing uh, OED, uh, OED uh, in the anterior chamber too. So uh, in the same way uh, it is uh, being performed with the, uh, what was the name of the capsulation? The capsulation, yes. In this, this what, case, it will work the, exactly the, the same. Can I ask you, do you have your femtosecond laser in the same operating theatre as you're doing your um, FACO surgery? Uh, yes, I, I, I have it inside and there in the room, yes. Okay, because many people don't. But the other issue is that you're going to, um, you'll be going into the eye um, before you're going to use the laser. You then have to move the patient to the laser. You then have to bring the patient back to the operating table. This seems to me to be an unnecessarily complicated way of, of, of dealing with these, these cataracts. The other advantage, which we haven't really talked about, is um, using the, the tripan blue approach, is as you've seen, the, the central feature, which gives us a clue as to the centration of the capsulotomy. And as we will be reporting in a study which is virtually finished, by actually having the capsulotomy centered and perfect symmetry for the overlap of the intraocular lens, that you would improve the patient's vision. Now, there have been previous studies where they said, oh, well, you know, it doesn't quite matter where the, the capsulotomy is in relative to the, to the lens. But this, we've shown this is not actually the case. And this is something that you can't do with a femtolaser. Your, your ability to center is based on what you think it looks like. And for the majority of people, this is actually done on the, uh, the center of the pupil rather than on the, the visual axis, which is what we've been able to achieve with, with capsule laser. And of course, with a white cataract, where the patient cannot fixate anyway, you, you've got this advantage. Um, that, that's absolutely true because I'm a capsule laser user. And you know, the possibility to, to have this centration on a particularly clear area in which you have the circle in the center is the, the, the line side because it's the paraxial uh, reflex. Definitely gives a tremendous advantage and, and makes Casotto to be centered by, by you and with a lot of control, which is uh, definitely something that I cannot accomplish with any other technology because I see where I want to center based on optical 
indicators in the, on the optical evidence that I have because of the anatomy of the, of the stain of the triple bloom. This is definitely, definitely one of the major advantages of capsulation technique today. Yeah. Yes, I think that uh, uh, we have 12, more than 12 years working with flags, with Katrak, and uh, Javier Mendicute showed us uh, a very interesting data about the penetration in, in the market and in the future uh, for the surgery of cataract surgery, okay? Uh, 12 years ago, all of us thought about that we would improve the safety instead of reducing the damage to the endothelial cells, and some cases like white cataract and uh, narrow anterior chamber, for example, talking about uh, safety and talking about efficacy we were thinking about mm -hmm. reducing the opacification of the posterior capsule because of the cover, complete cover of the optical, and also the possibility of reducing, tilting, improving uh, the sun focus that would reduce the light distribution of sun lenses. We were thinking about uh, this issue 12 years ago, and right now, 12 years later, we don't have enough evidence mm -hmm talking about clinical differences in between manual and femtosecond laser. This is the real situation. We have <laughs> that depth with our patient and the scientific community because we need more evidence, more uh, better design for the studies, um, more level of evidence, try to <laughs> convince ourselves and the community to improve our surgery to make differences with the manual surgery. I think this is the real problem. This is the elephant inside the room that we need to talk about. That, that's, that's true, you know, because we were the first using the femtosecond laser for cataract surgery in Spain. Uh, I was using the Alcon technology, and then I, I was very happy as a surgeon, but it was not sustainable. So we had to give it back to the company because we were losing money for, uh, in each eye. The problem is that I see now that there is a gap between what is offering the femtosecond, which is indeed a, a great technology. I, I like femto, and outside of Spain, I use femtosecond because some patients can, can pay that, but in Spain definitely it's difficult, and some mothers, like the one that Paco Pagliales has in Madrid, has accomplished to get uh, into the practice, the Fento Second Test, something that we couldn't do. But it's true that what we, what we have with the Fento is a wonderful machine, full of advantages, in my opinion. As a surgeon, I prefer femtosecond laser surgery because I have control on, the, on, on not on the casualties, but what, what I, how I soften or break the nucleus, everything is easier, but the problem is that the patient doesn't feel any, anything better than subjectively the, 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 the advantage to have been operated with advanced technology. But the real practice, they are not that much willing to pay. A, a, a private insurance do not want to pay because it's not uh, supported by evidence of any advantage. And this is the problem we have for the first time, in my opinion, in, in, in surgery, a gap between what we can do and what we do. And definitely, the, the, this is the cost effectiveness problem because the evidence in favor of French second is lacking because French studies, European studies, our studies that have been published, all of them have been uniform in terms of cost effectiveness with, to be negative in spite of the advantages that really we have. So this is uh, probably one of the issues and we have a distinguished panel here. And probably, Javier Aramberri, you are more or less in between, right? So what, what, what is your opinion about the, the potential that uh, clearly Javier Mendicuti in his excellent talk has shown to us with Fentosecond and the real uh, mm. advantages that we have versus the real application and the cost effectiveness? Hi everyone, Jorge, thank you very much for this introduction. And I fully support what you just said uh, before. I mean, the main issue with the uh, femtosecond laser surgery for cataracts is the cost effectiveness. I mean, I've been working with it for, for around 12 years. And the point is that it, it's still today, it's very difficult to sell it in our regular practice because as, as companies don't, don't cover this this uh, surgery and, and mostly patients uh, don't feel as we explain to them the theoretical and practical advantages of the technology many times uh, they just don't they prefer to go to a manual surgery the fact is that in our clinic most of surgeons are very expert so they can provide exactly a very similar uh, uh, result 
with a regular fake emulsification. Um, me, myself, I, I really don't miss the FACO when I'm doing surgery and I'm doing regular surgery. I, I know I'm providing just the same results. Of course, in certain cases, there is a definitive clinical advantage. I'm mean, thinking about very shallow anterior chamber depths where the, the, the flux surgery is still, in my opinion, above the manual surgery. And there might be some certain cases with, for example, um, subluxation of the, of the lens or this kind of particular cases where the, the flux is, in my opinion, mandatory to, to get a, a safer surgery. But generally speaking, for the, for the regular surgery, the point is that still today, 12, 13 years later, the cost effectiveness of flux surgery is, is, uh, is not uh, attractive, is not good. And that's why the penetration of this uh, technology has not significantly increased in the last 10 years. Thank you very much, Jaime. And uh, Miguel Angel, Gil, you are there. Uh, do you use Fentasecon? Laser no, I, have, no, I have no experience with this technology. We try to introduce uh, in our hospital uh, just before the pandemic. Uh, we have a, had a schedule a uh, trip to Donosti uh, because uh, Javier Mendicotti uh, kindly offered us the possibility of uh, achieve more knowledge in this technology. But uh, right now we don't use this technology in our hospital. Okay, Monse, and do you use Fentasecond in your practice? Uh, yes, in most of patients uh, that we implant uh, a premium IL, I think that um, Fentasecond laser is a, a very good option and we offer for all the patients, except for, for case patients with an orbital anatomy difficult, but in general, we use them. And as suggested by Joaquin, I think that uh, uh, in, in relation to the re refractive results, uh, comparing uh, conventional pacomestification compared to flux, uh, we have to, to think that most of the meta-analysis uh, have shown no differences in refractive results, but, but maybe all the, most of, um, of the studies included uh, compare monofocal IOLs. I think that uh, we need to have more studies comparing premium IOLs because uh, I think that uh, uh, the predictability of the, uh, the circularity of the uh, capsulotomy platforms that, uh, that, uh, can, that we can do the uh, capsulotomy center on the capsular back, uh, I think these possibilities are better for a premium IOL. And I think this predictability can improve the refractive results in premium IOLs. So in these cases, maybe not um, significant differences, not, it, that does not don't mean that uh, there are clinical differences and maybe slow differences uh, can be shown uh, in premium IOLs. So I think we need more evidence in the, more studies in, in these cases. So. Okay, and some other. Uh, do, do you, do you yeah. use? Yeah, yeah, Richard, please. Well, I was just going to say um, I agree completely with what Martin is, is saying because the study that we've uh, recently um, been doing is entirely with um, premium IOLs. In fact, it's mostly with with trifocals, and the two arms of the study. One has been based with the centration on the pupil, and the other on the tripan blue feature. And we have shown a consistent, better vision between these two. And I agree with you. I think this is something which really needs to be, to be shown because we all know that when you're using these lenses, your degree of tolerance for them to be not centered on the visual axis is quite small. And if they're not well centered on the visual axis, then the degradation of the retinal image is certainly there. You won't see it with a monofocal. You certainly won't see it with a, uh, a non-aspheric monofocal because you can move that half a, a millimeter and it, it, nobody will even notice. But where you've got these premium IOLs, particularly trifocals, diffractive uh, trifocals, there it's really, really important. And I think we have shown this difference and we will be publishing this study. Completely agree okay, with you, Richard. Let me ask <laughs> Salvador, Salvador del Pech. Salvador, do, do you use Fentasecond laser? Uh, yes, in Aiken we have the Simmer laser, the Sid 8. 
And we use it in all our premium patients and most of our non-premium uh, lens patients. So uh, every time that a patient wants a premium lens, uh, we use it and, uh, and the patient pays for it. And there's no problem in our clinical daily practice. Before I was in Aiken, I was in the in Hospital La Fe, and there we had the, 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 the one from Bausch, the, the femtosecond from Bausch, and we use it normally, but I agree with every one of you that it's more important when we are talking about premium lenses than when we are talking about uh, non-premium lenses or monofocal lenses. Uh, Javier, uh, I think that well, thank you. I like very much. Oh. Yeah, please. So, sorry, I think that the the there's a, there are two important steps when we are uh, working with a white cataract. One of it is the non-decompression. So with a femtosecond laser, we have a non-decompression. I, before uh, doing the rexis or whatever with these uh, uh, white lenses, and the other one is the is uh, the velocity, the, the, to do it quickly or not. So I think that uh, the capsule laser has not a decompression. Uh, it has the problem is, is that we are not working We are the comp we are doing a decompression before acting to the to the lens, but the velocity is it's much is it's much important in this in this kind of laser. And with the femtosecond laser, we have the opposite. We do it by the moment more slowly than with the uh, capsule laser, but we have a non decompression eye, which is important for uh, the approach of these white uh, cataracts. Okay, L let me now address a question to our good friend and excellent speaker, uh, Javier, uh, uh, Javier Medicute. Javier, thank you very much for your presentation, very comprehensive. And you have uh, listened to what I said, that there is a gap between what is the future, it might be the future is femtosecond, clearly. I, do, I, I see that this, this technology will, in the future, will be available and more general, but based on the cost that, it, that today we have, is not affordable for many surgeons and many patients. So I think that we need to stimulate the, 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 the industry in order to provide a better service to ophthalmologists and patients with less costly instruments. So do you think that in the future cost effectiveness will be accomplished? Because the evidence, you know, and I agree with Montserrat and Salvador, the evidence will be for premium lenses because more and more these lenses depend on centration, on the absence of teal, etc. But meanwhile, we need to make this affordable for the patient and at this moment is not affordable for many patients. So what is your idea, your, your vision about the future of this time in terms of development into a much more cost-effective cost effective technology? I, I agree with all of you uh, related with, uh, from the cost-effectiveness point of view, I think that this technology at this moment, it has no sense for the majority of surgeons and for the majority of patients. But if we are thinking about future, I think that this is one door that we, we can't close at this moment. I think that in the next future, we will have this technology for the world for many surgeons. I think that they have to improve from the ergonomical point of view. I, 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 my desire related with this technology is to have the femtosecond laser just in the surgical theater close to the femtosecond, a new platforms integrating the facomulsification machine and the femtolaser, they will be available in 12 months. And I think that it could be the first step related with that. But then the possibilities that they offer to manage uh, obviously uh, multifocal IOS or other kind of things, uh, uh, could be one possibility, but the possibility to uh, change the optical design of intraocular lenses uh, could be another way to improve that. And obviously, if the technology is uh, will be popular, the prices they will be decreasing. I I remember that Jorge when. Uh, when you bought the first Excimer laser in Spain, the technology was very, very expensive. And then after years, the technology decreased uh, the prices for 
uh, doctors, and I think that the, I hope the same future for this technology. But for me, the main issue related with this technology now is the price, and the second one, the technology have to improve from the ergonomical point of view. Yeah, I agree, and you, you know, this is why I believe that cost effectiveness uh, in capsulotomy was why to be attended. You know, I think that capsulotomy has a, no, no cost almost as an added cost to the patient, but on, on, on the other hand, what uh, Paco Bajares mentioned is true, you can systematize in your team how to perform the most variable a, a, a maneuver that happens in, in, in modern surgery, which is definitely casularesis. I think that we, uh, in this environment in which we are in a, in, in a, in a not, not a positive future economically with a crisis that is at this moment evident for every, in, in all countries with the high inflation levels with the, the mean income becoming lower because of inflation. I don't see room for high tech, high cost, but for high tech, adequate cost. And this is the advantage that I see to these devices that are based on, on the use of light, like casualization, not, not based on the use of instruments that you have to introduce in the eye, really have a, a potential for development. I think that we are now at this moment over time. Uh, well, I think that we uh, want to thank everybody. We conducted this session in English. Uh, it's a privilege for, for Richard. Thank you for being here today. And thank you for your participation. Indeed, we have another section now, and we shall have you as discussed. So thank you very much for your kind contribution to the speakers and to my colleagues and friends here conducting this session. Thank you very much, and the session is closed.